Hey friends, it's good to be back with you. Today I'd like to go over first and second order systems. What are those? It's what that really means is first and second order differential equations. Now the last couple of videos on differential equations, I've talked about them in kind of a generic, general sort of way. But for many of us, and especially those of us who are engineers, you're going to see a lot of first and second order linear differential equations. And that seems awfully specific, but it's surprising how many things we analyze in the world can be approximated by first and second order linear differential equations. So many, in fact, that it's worth going over those specifically. Now, I can't go over every physical system that'll give you a first or second order linear differential equation, so I'm going to pick one. This is a mechanical one you see in textbooks all the time. And in my career working in noise and vibration, I've seen this almost daily. So this is basically a weight hanging from a spring with a, with a uh, damper or shock absorber on it. And this is how we draw it. Now this isn't what the system is going to look like, but this is what it acts like. And this, this level of abstraction is very powerful because it lets us take complicated systems, represent them simply, and then write out the equations. So if you want to think about this physically, this is literally a weight hanging from a spring. And the spring is not ideal. It's, it's, it's linear, but it has some damping in it. And the way we draw this, this, this stuff up here, this is just a boundary condition. This is the, the, the graphical shorthand for you know, something that is rigid and massive. If you want to think of it physically, this is just a giant block of concrete. Whatever is up here is so rigid and so massive, it doesn't matter. It's not going to move no matter what we do. Here's a weight. K is, for, uh, is constant for a spring. The force generated by a spring is K delta X, where X or, X or delta X, you see both of them actually, where K is the spring constant and X is the displacement of the spring. And this thing right here, in the old timey books, they would call this a dash pot, but this is a shock absorber. If you look inside a shock absorber, what you're going to see is there's, there's oil in there, and as the shock absorber moves back and forth, you're trying to push that oil through an orifice, a little hole. It doesn't want to go. And so what you'll find out if you play with a shock absorber is you push slowly, it doesn't push back very hard. It takes relatively little force to compress it. If you try to push quickly, it stiffens right up. So the, the force generated by a shock absorber, like I said, the old timey books call it a dash pot, um, is proportional to velocity, not displacement. And then we need a coordinate system, so I'll do x positive down just because I need a direction. And also, I have a, an external force applied. Well, let's just do what Newton would have us do. And let's say that the sum of the forces equals ma. Seems safe enough. Let's see. So the force downward, I'll say f of t. Now, if I'm moving downwards, positive x, and the spring stretches, the force it makes is kx, but the force on that mass is upwards. So that's going to be minus kx. And same thing here. The reaction force from that shock absorber, that dash pot, is up. So that's minus cx dot, okay, where the dot is a time derivative. And all that stuff is ma. Well, what's ma? ma is v dot. Okay, and we're right here, x dot equals dx dt. I think you've seen this before, but in case you haven't, there's two kinds of notation for derivatives. If you see a dot above the variable, it's understood to be a time derivative. If you see a single quote or hash mark after it, let's see, I've already used x. Let's see, y dash would be dy dx. This is just notational. So dot means time derivatives, dash means spatial derivative usually. Get that out of the way. So that's uh, the right side of Newton's law is mv dot. Well, the problem is v isn't the variable I'm working with. x is the variable I'm working with. Well, that also turns into, if you want to look at it this way, that's x double dot. The second derivative of position with respect to time, that's acceleration. It's the rate of change of velocity. So, well, let's see. Let's rearrange this a little bit. And I'm going to get mx double dot plus 
plus cx plus dot plus kx equals f of t. All right, that's an, called an equation of motion. Okay, that's an equation of motion. If you know m, c, and k, and you know what the external force is, you can figure out what the motion of that mass is going to be. And see right there, those two dots? That makes it a second order system. Right? How do you turn it into a first order system? Well, eliminate the mass. What if the mass went to zero? Well, that term goes to zero, and what I've got left is a first order system. So, difference between a first order and a second order system, does that second derivative exist? If it does, second order system. If it doesn't, first order system. Now, I mentioned that many, many physical systems will give you first and second order governing equations. It doesn't have to be a mass on a spring. Lots of circuits will do this. If you've ever taken a, let's see, what is the linear circuits class, and you have an RLC circuit, so resistance, capacitance, and inductance. Well, a resistor acts like a spring. See, a capacitor acts like a, a damper, and the inductor acts like a mass mathematically. Obviously, it doesn't do it physically. So as you're analyzing RLC circuits, you're going to get first and second order behavior pretty routinely. Now sometimes more complicated systems will also exhibit first or second order behavior. Think of something really complicated like a jet flying along that has a flight control system and all the complications that go along with that. Is that strictly a first or second order system? Not really, if you go into the details, but at, at a uh, first approximation, you really can explain what's going on with first and second order linear differential equations a lot of the time. So let me erase my board here and let's take a closer look at how we're going to go about solving that. Okay, so I've cleared off my board and rewritten the differential equation of motion up here. Now we know a couple of ways to solve this. One of them is we could use finite differences. Another one is we could use software like MathCAD or MATLAB. And we also know how to do this using Laplace transforms. Let's try that one, see what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in the Laplace transform for x double dot, x dot, and x. And what am I going to do with f of t? I don't have one right now. Well, let's assume f of t is 0. And let's assume that the initial velocity is 0, but the initial position is not. And what that means is I'm like pulling the weight down and then just letting it go so it'll oscillate. All right, so zero initial velocity, non-zero initial position, and then zero force. So just pulling down, letting it go, and just seeing what happens. So let's let that go to zero. And let's write this all out in Laplace domain. Okay, so got that all written out. Let's start applying our boundary conditions. So we decided that x dot of zero equals zero. Okay, so no initial velocity, but there is an initial position. Oops, try that again. And I'll just call it one. I need some round numbers right now. So the, the masses that I'm about to substitute in, and the stiffness and the damping and everything, I'm gonna use round numbers for that, and that's a nice round number. All right, so let's substitute those in. Well, that's 0, that's 1, and that's 1. So give me a second, let me rewrite this for you. All right, there we go. Everything's written now. We've seen this before. Now, the capital X is X of S. This is X in the Laplace domain, this lowercase one. Let's see right there. That was in the time domain. So the next step is to do a little bit of algebra so that we've got x of s equals something over here. So I'm going to go ahead and write that out now. Okay, there we have it. x in the s domain is all this stuff. And remember, what we're trying to find is we're trying to find x as a function of time. Well, it's too hard to do that here, so we transformed it in the x domain. Or the, I'm sorry, the S domain, and did a little bit of algebra and got to here. Well, this wasn't too hard. 
So all I've got to do now is inverse transform that back into time domain. And there's a couple of ways to do this. One is to do a partial fraction expansion of this and back it all out, which you can do. It, it's a little tedious, but it's not very hard. The second one is basically cop out and let's go to software. I'm going to go ahead and do that. If you want to do this by hand, I encourage you to do it, but I don't want this uh, video to be 10 hours long. So right now, let's go over to MathCAD or MATLAB. Either one of them works. I'm going to use MathCAD just because it's easier to look at, but that's the only reason. Um, and we'll go ahead and do the inverse transform. OK, I've moved us over to MathCAD Prime now and written out right there the expression we had on the board just a second ago. Now I needed some numbers for m, c, and k, so I just said m equals 1, c is 0 0.1, and k is 10. Now these don't have any physical significance, I just needed round numbers to keep this from getting too uh, complicated. So all I have to do now is do an inverse Laplace of that. I can do it, I can type it in there, or the other thing I can do is go up to Symbolics. It's easier to just grab it right there. So there we go. Now, all these numbers you get are there. Oh, there we go. Because I have numerical values of M, C, and K, and they had to go through an inverse transform. Now, because this is being done symbolically, it doesn't know to stop at, the, at a reasonable number of decimal points. It just gives, them, uh, gives you all of them. What I can do is, here's what it's going to look like if I don't tell it what MC and K are. There it is. And this is correct, but it's kind of messy. Looks like there might be a way to clean this up a little bit. Not sure. But anyway, I'm just going to leave those up there and just live with that. Now what does this look like? Let's go ahead and just plot it and see what we get. Now, one of the things about uh, second order systems is they oscillate, they vibrate. So you can imagine if you had a weight on a spring with very low damping, that if you pulled it and released, it would sit there and oscillate up and down. You know, if you did that with a slinky or something, you've seen this kind of behavior before. Or if you tied a rock to a rubber band and pulled the rock down and let it go, it would bounce up and down for a while until the damping, you know, the internal energy loss, uh, reduce the amplitude to zero and it quit moving. So that we should get oscillatory behavior here. It should, should be sinusoidal. Oh, son of a gun, there it is. All right, sinusoidal behavior, just exactly what you'd expect. Now we can play around with this a little bit now that we've got an answer we like. What happens if I reduce the damping? Well, if the damping reduces, the, de the decay rate should go down. It should oscillate longer. So let's put another zero in there to make it 0.01. And you can see that it's, it's, the amplitude's going down, but very, very slowly. Well, what happens if stiffness goes down? You know, then the resonant frequency should go down and those peaks should be farther apart. And they are. Okay, so this is behaving exactly like we think it ought to. And all, we, all we're dealing with now is these, these nasty numbers in there. Now, there's also an ordinary differential equation solver in MathCAD. There are several in MATLAB and I'm going to go to those in a few minutes here. Let's just double check and make sure we've got the same answer we would get if we ran it directly through a differential equation solver. And because we need a, a, a point to check, let's, let's do this. Over here, let's, what is x at 20? 0 0.34. Well, let's go up another couple of digits here. 3403. Okay, well, that's an exact answer. Well, exact enough. Um, there's a finite number of decimal points there, but I'm only looking for four decimal points. So 3403 at 20, that's, that's our touchstone, I guess. Okay, let's solve the same problem directly now using the ODE solver in MathCAD. So what I've done here is just written out the differential equation with the force equals zero, set the, the initial conditions. So 
non-zero initial position, zero initial velocity, and the command is just called ODE solve. And I'm going to solve it from x equal or t equals zero to t equal 20. Now if we did this right, plot this, I should get, let's see if I can do this, there it is, I should get the same answer. I'm going to have to scroll up a little bit. There we go. That sure looks right. Let's check and see what x of 20 is. 3, 4. We had 3, 4, oh, 3 before. We have 3, 4, oh, 2. Now, this is a numerical solver. So it's not unsurprising if there's just a little bit of difference between the Laplace solution and the numerical solution using ODE solve. But for practical purposes, we did get the same answer, and it's behaving the same. Now, as I said, this is a second order system. What happens when I let the mass equal zero and turn it into a first order system? Now, we would expect that it doesn't oscillate anymore. We've displaced it, and we'd expect that the displacement would go to zero, but not instantaneously because of the damping. Well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and set m equals zero here. Now, look what happens here. Instead of having uh, an oscillatory term, it's just e to the minus 100t. Well, that's about what that would look like, I think. Hard to see in uh, linear, linear axes. What would happen if we went back to plotting and made that a logarithmic scale? Oh, there we go. Now, look at the numbers here. These are crazy. Let's make this one. So it obviously doesn't take long at all to go from x equal one to x equal zero. Let's try this one more here. There we go. And let's go ahead and turn off the logarithmic axis real quick to see what we're looking at. Yeah, there you go. That's what exponential decay looks like. Now, one last thing I want to point out is the factors that will change this decay rate. Now, if the damping is much higher, say 0.5 instead of 0.1, you can see that it takes longer for the amplitude or the, the displacement to decay down to zero. And the other thing that'll change it is that the stiffness changes. So instead of 10, let's make it two. And now it's taking longer still. Let's let's move this out. Let's go from uh, t equals zero to t equal one. And you still get the same exponential behavior. In fact, you can see it right there. But instead of minus, I think it was 100t that I had before, now I have 4t. And I can change it again. And I can change this. What if I make these both one? There, I get e to the minus t. And let's uh, make extend that out to two, perhaps. And you see, you still get the decaying exponential. All we're arguing about now is the time it takes to completely decay. And if you go into logarithmic uh, semi-log axis, it goes straight again. Now I'm using MathCAD as a stepping stone to MATLAB. And the reason was this right here, this ODE solve. The way ODC, ODE solve works in MathCAD is pretty straightforward. It's easy to just type in the differential equation and solve it. In MATLAB, you need to do one more step. You need to do something called state space, which is not very hard. It's got kind of a mystifying name. But let's go back to the board and let's figure out how to do this same equation in MATLAB.